Hello again, everyone, and welcome back. This is uh, a continuation of our week two re uh, review video, and I'm going to be talking now about chapter four, which is about socialization and the construction of reality. Now, uh, in the last video for chapter three, I already started talking about uh, a number of these concepts, such as socialization and social construction. Um, so this chapter goes into a lot more detail about um, how those processes take place. Um, so as I mentioned before, you know, socialization is essentially the process, uh, as they say in the book, it's the process by which you learn how to become a functioning member of society. Um, it starts the day you were born and it's basically all of the ways in which you are taught um, the norms and the, and the values and the basic practices and behaviors of society. A lot of it can have to do with uh, beliefs, and uh, but a lot of it also can have to do with um, just basic behaviors on a day-to-day on -day level that you may not even be aware of. Things like, um, you know, when someone walks up to you and says, hey, how's it going? You don't respond by telling them every detail of your day you know, uh, it's more of just a polite question. And you typically would just say like, oh, I'm fine. How are you? You know, that's because we've been socialized. We, we understand that uh, without it necessarily having to be written down or, or um, you know, specified in any way. Uh, it's an unspoken norm that we've been socialized into understanding. Uh, and there are many of these throughout society and we pick them up as we grow without even realizing it. Oftentimes through observing other people, observing our parents, oftentimes our parents sort of correct our behavior as children. And as we grow up, we, we learn to accept and internalize uh, these values and behaviors uh, that are taught to us and that are, that are all around us in our environment and in our culture. So, um, you know, the textbook starts off with a perfect example of this. You know, when you walk into a classroom on the first day of school, you know to sit down at a desk and face the front and wait for class to start. You know to raise your hand uh, if you have a question and things like that. You know, how do you know this stuff? Well, it's because for many years now, you've been socialized how to be a student. You've been taught to stand in line to wait your turn to raise your hand when you have a question you know you don't go and sit in the behind the podium uh, at the front of the classroom because that's where the professor that's where the teacher is going to be you you know these things already you've been socialized into this way of being a student and to all the norms and behaviors that go along with that and that that applies to all of life and, and many different levels of life um, and it happens, you know, all the time, all around us. Um, the video has a funny little example of being on an elevator. Like, you may not have noticed this before, but when everyone gets on an elevator, they face towards the door. They don't face towards the back wall, you know, of the elevator. If you were to get in the elevator and face the wrong direction, people would kind of look at you like you're weird. Um, and that's what we call an informal sanction, when people kind of give you funny looks, and it's kind of a, it's a subtle indicator that, Maybe you're not behaving the correct way. So we pick up on these cues and we figure out the correct ways to behave uh, and how to be a good member of society, essentially. Now, this goes back again to this whole debate of nature versus nurture. And of course, as sociologists, we're mostly interested in the nurture part. Uh, but even the nurture part can sort of become part of our nature. Uh, in sociology, we talk about we use two words, uh, mostly structure and agency. These are very two important words to know. And structure typically just refers to everything external to us that influences us. Whereas agency refers to our own sort of free will, our own ability to act and make decisions. Um, but sometimes, you know, the, the, the structure can have an influence on us in such a way it socializes us that we internalize uh, certain things that affect our own agency. But nonetheless, you know, we have agency. Uh, and so we're able to, we're not just complete products of our environment. We also have the ability to make choices for ourselves. Um, so it's kind of a balance between these two things. So um, 
continuing on, uh, there are a number of different theories uh, about socialization in sociology uh, and the actual processes of how socialization takes place. Um, one of the most important ones uh, and well-known ones was started by a sociologist named uh, Charles Cooley, uh, who came up with this the concept of the self. Um, and the self is how a person perceives sort of their own identity. Um, and he had this idea that he called the looking glass self, which is a way of uh, people understanding themselves through the eyes of others and learning to distinguish the difference between the I and the you. Um, now, uh, a sociologist named George Herbert Mead uh, expanded upon this idea and came up with what he called the, the stages of development of the self. And um, a lot of this can be seen and sort of related to the stages of childhood development. Um, it begins with, uh, with infants, they just have a sense of, of the I, which is one's own sort of desires and wants and, and agency, and that's pretty much it. Um, they can't really understand things from another person's perspective or understand how they might appear to another person. They're not self-conscious in any kind of way like that. Um, but as a child grows over, older, they develop what he calls the me. And the me is when one is able to understand the self as a distinct object uh, that is perceived by others. Uh, so it, it's, it's a sort of a higher level of self-awareness in which you're able to begin to sort of empathize and sort of see yourself through the eyes of other people. And um, the, the third stage then is what he calls developing a sense of the other, which is um, other people, not just how they see you, but the idea that other people also exist and have their own sort of needs and wants and also have to be uh, sort of taken into consideration. So originally as a child, you know, a child that only understands the I, you know, when their diaper is wet, they're going to cry at night and they're not really putting any consideration into the fact that they're waking up their parents at five o'clock in the morning or whatever, um, because they haven't developed that sense of awareness. They have no sense of the other, uh, which would be the parents in this example. So, you know, this is a, uh, this is a very important theory and understanding the difference between the I, the me, and the other is, uh, is very important. Um, and so I highly suggest you read carefully about uh, Cooley and Mead. Um, Mead also goes on to talk about this concept of what he calls the generalized others, which is um, a, a much broader sense of the other when we begin to um, sort of internalize what we think the expectations of others are. Um, and the other in this sense can be like all of society, essentially. So we begin to understand our own role in society by understanding what's expected of us. Um, and, you know, basically having a desire not to be a jerk and things like that. Um, he also talks about um, the play stage and the game stage. So uh, know the difference between those two as well. Um, the play stage is basically when children start to imitate others uh, and take on the role of others. Uh, but the game stage, so the, the play stage is more associated with like the me, uh, but then the game stage is when children are more able to learn. It's more complicated. They're able to play with like a whole team of people. Um, and so that's more of, a, of an understanding of the other, uh, but of multiple others. So understanding like how one oneself fits into a team, understanding one's position on a, on a baseball team or something like that, for example. It's not something they can do as a toddler, but once they have reached that stage of development um, where they can begin to understand the other, then, uh, then they can get into that um, more complex stage. Uh, the textbook also talks about agents of social socialization. Um, we talked about this a lot with the media in the last chapter. Uh, basically, these are the sources through which uh, people are socialized as they grow up and even as they become adults. And this can be not just the media, but, you know, 
probably the main one would be your family. Um, you're also socialized through your friends, through school. You know, um, even now, like, as I mentioned before, you know how to behave as a student because you've been socialized how to be, you know, a student, how to behave correctly as a student, what's expected of you as a student um, for many years now. Um, and socialization continues even through adulthood. Um, the book talks about total institutions. Um, this is a, another important concept. A uh, total institution is a is an institution which controls every aspect of a person's life, um, how they eat, how they, what time they sleep, what they do during the day. Uh, the military is a perfect example. So if you were to join the military, you would basically go through a kind of re-socialization process to be socialized into the role of being a soldier. And in the military, it's very much a total institution where they control every aspect of your life while you were in the military. Um, a mental hospital would also be a total institution or a prison where they control every aspect of, of every moment of a person's life. Um, there's also some important concepts to know uh, from Robert Merton when we get into social interaction here. Uh, status is a, is a position a person occupies, which can be a job or, or a certain type of uh, role. Um, or the, the role is essentially the kind of the duties and behaviors that go along with the status. So um, a status could be, you know, being a professor is my status and my duties that go along with that involve me dressing in a certain way. You know, if I were going into class, I would, you know, be wearing a nice shirt. I would have my briefcase, my coffee, you know, I would speak to the class in a certain way. You know, there's certain sort of expectations and, uh, and, uh, and duties and behaviors that go along with that status of being a professor. Uh, role strain is something when you have duties for a particular uh, role or status that are difficult uh, and maybe overwhelming and place a strain on a person. Um, for example, it actually talks about in the textbook, like being a professor, there's a certain strain between uh, you're required to publish your own research, but you're also required to teach classes at the same time. And there can sometimes be a strain there trying to divide your time between these two activities. Um, it also talks about role conflicts, which has to do with when you have multiple roles. Everyone has multiple roles. You could be, you know, you can have a job like a professor. You can also have a role of being a parent. Uh, you could have another role of being a friend. You, know, you can have many different roles at the same time, and sometimes these roles can conflict with one another. Sometimes your job demands more time when you need to be at home uh, taking care of your kid or something along those lines. So that would be role conflicts. Um, status set is basically just all of the roles that you have at a given time. A scribe status is something that is um, involuntary. It's something that's sort of put onto you. Uh, that you don't have control over. So like your ethnicity is an ascribed status, you know, um, you can't really change that. Uh, An achieved status, on the other hand, is something you earn. So a college degree, being a college graduate, for example, is something that you earn, that you worked for, that you didn't have to do. So that's more of an achieved status. Uh, and then your master status is basically the, out of your whole status set, the one that's sort of most prominent or most dominant. Um, sometimes it can be kind of hard to tell, but usually everyone has one or maybe it switches from time to time, depending on what context you're in at the moment. I think, you know, my professor status is the master status, uh, for me. Uh, but once this video is over, that will probably switch to something else. <laughs> um, excuse me. Um, it also talks about gender roles, which I talked about a little bit. In the previous video, uh, when I was talking about gender socialization, we're socialized into these roles. Um, in the video that I, one of the videos I assigned today uh, talks about how, or it displays how Disney films, which a lot of us grew up with, really display and socialize us into a lot of the expectations and norms of certain gender roles, um, of what it means to be a normative sort of female and male in what's expected of you. Um, so uh, part two of the video is